Good morning, Southside. Good morning. I love that. I want to give a warm welcome to any of our guests and visitors. We're so happy to be worshiping with you today. My name is Sean Kissman. I often get confused with Sean Killian. <laughs> I have no idea why. We are in our third installment of a four-week uh, series on the book of Malachi, taking a break from our steadfast march through Romans. A relay race in a track normally has four runners, uh, the stra- uh, where the first runner hands off the baton to the second runner, and so on and so on. Now, the strategy of a track relay race is to put your top three runners in the first, second, and fourth slot. <laughs> And then you tell your slowest runner, just don't drop the baton. (laughs) So no pressure. Turn in your Bibles uh, to Malachi 2, uh, uh, verse 17, Malachi chapter 2, verse 17, which is where we, we will start today. To review, Malachi, the last book in the Old Testament of our English Bible, was written after Judah's ex, uh, return from exile, about 400 to 450 years uh, before the birth of Christ. When they returned, they were looking for the presence of God to return to the temple. But now, they were starting to lose hope of his return, and they began to live like the world around them. Steve Lawson said that going through Malachi is like going through a car wash with the windows down. It really comes at you. He says this because Malachi's message is one of rebuke and an indictment of Israel. Yet, the book holds out hope for those who fear God. One of the things I hope you are seeing through Malachi are the correlations, the similarities Uh, the comparisons and contrasts of the then and now. This message is strong, unrelenting, and impassioned because Malachi was living in critical times. May this book be an example for us as we hearken back to the call of only a month ago to live missionally, multiply locally, and reach globally and have that Malachi mindset and proclaim the God that we love to a world that needs him. The book is generally laid out in six disputes where God accuses Israel. Israel objects to that accusation, and God responds to their objection with proof. So it could be outlined as six disputes of um, accusation, objection, and proof. um, We've taken the first two weeks first two weeks of almost uh, the first two chapters, which includes the first three disputes. If you recall, the first dispute was over whether God loves them or not. The second dispute was over their worship, specifically as it uh, pertained to offerings and the priests. And the third dispute was accusing them of divorcing and remarrying pagan wives. Now, these last two weeks have been strong, and rightly so. My dad, who was a high school football and basketball coach, used to say, or he would say, Malachi is bringing the wood. Do they still say that now? I don't know. Malachi is bringing the wood. Today, we're going to cover the fourth and fifth disputes. Chapter 2, verse 17, marks the division in the book between Judah's sin and apostasy, described in chapters 1 and 2, with Judah's judgment and ultimate blessing in chapters 3 and 4. So the transition is from how they have been to what will happen to them. It also introduces to the accusation, objection, and proof outline two new elements, the remedy and the result of the remedy. So for those of you taking notes, the general outline is accusation, objection, then proof, remedy, and result. Let's start with prayer. Father, as we come before you, 
we rejoice in this day, the day that you have created. And we are so thankful um, that you reveal yourself through your word. We, we are thankful that we get a fellowship with you. We're thankful for the fellowship that you provide with one another. We just pray that that would be a, a, a light in the darkness. We pray also, Father, that as you reveal yourself to us, that we would be changed, that we would, we would have a heart to proclaim who you are to others. We ask that uh, you would be with us in and of by, and by the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Quick note, the first aspar... Uh, could you guys hear me okay before? Good. All right. Uh, quick note, uh, this first dispute starts in chapter 2, 17. Hope you guys are there. And goes down to uh, chapter 3, verse 6. We start with God saying this. You have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet you say, how have we wearied him? And that you say, everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or, where is the God of justice? Here is the accusation. You have wearied the Lord with your words. And to be clear, this is an anthropomorphism. God doesn't grow tired or weary, as he makes clear in Isaiah 40, verse 28, which says, the everlasting God... The Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. However, their lack of patience in a God that doesn't change, their lack of love for a God of love, and their lack of trust in a faithful God seems to go on and on and on, to which God says, enough. Their response to his accusation is, I am falling on my face in repentance, O Lord. No. Their objection to to his accusation is, how have we wearied him? And this is not a query, but an argumentative response. I don't believe you, God. Prove it. But they say it in a question. In fact, I think you have to read it in the tone of an obstinate, argumentative teenager. (laughs) Really? We've worried you? How? And it's a result of a low view of God. We see throughout history, Israel tries to bring the sovereign, creating, sustaining Yahweh down to the level of the idols of the nations around them. And so they object to his accusation. Then God gives them proof of his accusation here. The rest of the verse says, In that you say, Everyone who does evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delights in them. Or where is the God of justice? They've continually said that those who do evil not only get their way, but seem to be favored by God. They are challenging God by saying, Where is the God of justice? And some would even say that they are starting to move into a pos- or, uh, uh, atheism. There is no God. Keep in mind, these are the same people who questioned God's love in chapter 1, who offered polluted sacrifices because they had a low view of God, which results in a low worship of God. These are the same people who, in chapter 2, didn't see God as holy, set apart, righteous, and they didn't respect him when they set them apart from the other nations. And consequently, they married foreign wives. What's more, they divorced the wives of their use, abandoning those wives and the covenantal love of God to marry those foreign wives. And yet, they call on God to judge others who they see as wicked, and when he doesn't provide their humanly divined, uh, devised justice, they mock him. This should give us pause to ask, do we question God's motive when we see the world growing more wicked day by day? Do we ever ask, where is the God of justice? Or do we see God's patience and his merciful plan to allow more of this world to come to him? We should have an incredible desire for God to show mercies to others as we have been shown that mercy. 
Amen? Amen. God's answer to Israel starts in verse 1 of chapter 3. You want judgment? You're going to get judgment. But thankfully, thankfully, you will get more than judgment. I'm going to judge, but I'm also going to love you, show mercy to you, because I am holy, faithful, and merciful, as well as just. God's remedy is spelled out here in Malachi 3, verse 1. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. We need to identify the players in this verse first. Behold, I am going to send. This should be obvious. This is God the Father. I'm going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. This is the second person. Most would agree that this is the promise of John the Baptist, the final prophet before Christ's first advent. Jesus explicitly identifies John as this person in in Matthew chapter 11, verse 9. It says, But what did you go out to see in the wilderness? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will, pre- who will prepare your way before you. And it's interesting that Christ changed the, changes the me to the you, but that's, that's the subject for another sermon. So we have God the Father sending a messenger to prepare the way of the Lord. Continuing on, continuing on it says, And the messenger whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. And a quick side note here. In case the irony is lost on us, the whom you seek and the whom you delight in is a sarcastic uh, reference to Israel's cry for the God of justice. Okay, we have God sending a messenger before the Lord and the messenger of the covenant. But these aren't two different people, especially in the light of verse 6. Here the Lord, Adonai, and the messenger of the covenant are one and the same. As we can t- continue through this dispute, we will see this clearly identifying Jesus Christ as the, the Adonai, the Lord, and the messenger of the covenant. J. Vernon McGee said, I look for Jesus Christ on every page of the Old Testament. And here, with blinking arrows, it's pointing to him, as we will see later. Keep in mind, Old Testament saints didn't have the perspective that we have of Christ's first and second advent. John the Baptist, for example, understood that Christ was the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Yet at the same time, he expected the day of the Lord as well, where the wicked would be punished and the kingdom would be established. In fact, John sent his disciples to ask Jesus in uh, Luke 7, 20, are you the expected one or do we look for someone else? And in verse 22, Jesus answered and said, go and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel preached to them. John the Baptist was of the tribe of Levi. He knew the scriptures concerning the Messiah. So Jesus shows John the Baptist the first part of Isaiah 35 and the first part of Isaiah 61 which John would know. But he didn't answer John with the rest of the story, so to speak. Jesus didn't quote the day of vengeance of our God language to John, which John thought was part and parcel with the Lamb. See, see both happen, it's not at the same time. Turn to, turn to Luke 4, verse 16. Turn with me to Luke 4, verse 16. Jesus indirectly proclaims the two advents here in Luke, and this is the only gospel account of this. This is the account of Jesus standing up in the synagogue 
and reading Isaiah 61, verse 1, and part of verse 2, which is key. Luke 4, verse 16 says, And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and stood up, and stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, and he opened the book and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are, opp are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord." And he closed the book, and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. So, to both John and the people of Nazareth, he declares that he is Messiah. Yet he specifically leaves out the day of vengeance from both of their responses. Isaiah 61 verse 2 reads, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. We, say, we see that in verse 19 of Luke 4. To proclaim the favorable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God. We see that day in more detail in chapter 4 of Malachi but this is a future return of Christ. And Old Testament saints didn't know this. They saw it as one event, but clearly show, uh, God clearly shows us that Christ will return. Amen? And the reason for this inner advent time, I hope, is still fresh in our minds from Romans 11, so that we may be grafted in, so that many sons can come to glory, as Hebrews says. So God will send a messenger then the Lord, then the messenger of the, uh, messenger of the covenant will come. Back to Malachi verse, uh, 3, verse 1. Malachi 3, verse 1. You see the word suddenly in here. It says, suddenly come to his temple. That suddenly doesn't mean immediately as in now. It is almost always associated in Scripture with a calamitous event. This just reiterates that this is a warning. Where is the God of justice, you ask? Be careful what you wish for, O Israel. And verse 2 begins with two questions. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Who can endure the day of his coming? Can you? I hope that's a question that we all ask ourselves. We get a clear answer in the next chapter, but that's, that's for Greg for next week. It continues, For he, it says, is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. This is purification language. Refiner's fire. First, what it's not. It isn't a forest fire. It doesn't destroy indiscriminately. It is also not an incinerating fire. It doesn't consume completely. It is fire. So it's something that we have to dread. But, as, but a refiner's fire is very specific. It refines, it purifies whatever is in there, and something valuable comes out. So we see there that, that therefore this is not merely a word of warning, but also a word of tremendous hope. It accomplishes a purpose. He is like refiner's fire. We see its companion statement, and like fuller's soap. Fuller's soap was used to bleach garments to make them white, which is a symbol of righteousness. So this Lord, this messenger of the covenant, will return like a refiner's fire and fuller's soap to purify and make righteous the people of Israel. And only Jesus Christ can purify. Only Jesus Christ can cleanse. We know from 1 John that if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Christ is the messenger of the covenant. He purifies. He makes righteous. And in verse 3, we see that he, Christ, 
will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. Again, very vivid imagery. A smelter of silver was unique because silver was unique. God is easy, uh, gold is easier to refine because it, it just follows one step. Just add a lot of heat to it. But silver, silver has to be heated to remove the dross, but also to drive out all the oxygen from the silver because the oxygen dulls the silver. And when the smelter has driven it out, he can look into the smelting pot and see the silver reflecting his own image. The correlation here is phenomenal. In Romans 8, 29, it says, For those whom he, God speaking, foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, and son uh, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 18, it says, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one glory to another, right? Through the Spirit of the Lord. And that's not all. That's not all. The smelter and purifier of silver still had one final step to do. To seal the silver so no oxygen, oxygen would get back in and dull it. He would seal it with ash or coal to ensure that it would remain pure, that it would shine, that it would reflect the image of the smelter. We know Ephesians 4, verse 30, as a scripture about not grieving the Holy Spirit. But the whole verse reads like this. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And this imagery compared to Malachi is astounding, refined, purified, reflecting the image of the smelter and sealed for the day of redemption. How beautiful is it to see God weave this perfect, beautiful tapestry through Malachi in the midst of judgment to show his covenantal love to purify and cleanse his people. And the final result, the result is a promise of hope. We see this, it says, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Christ is the messenger of the covenant and comes to change them into his image. Now they see God for who he is, holy, just, righteous, but also merciful, gracious, and loving. That view of God results in beautiful worship. And the offerings are a result of that beautiful worship. Offerings of righteousness. And it's the same for us too, isn't it? We see God's work of salvation for us and we present our bodies as a, as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Of worship. Any offering we give God is simply a reflection of our worship of him. Remember that for later. That's going to be on the test, okay? Okay, verse 4 is now the fulfillment, the future fulfillment of Romans 11.26. 11.26 says, And so all Israel will be saved, just as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. With it removed, we see here in verse 4, then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as, as, and as in former years. Pleasing worship will be restored. This is the exact opposite of Israel's unacceptable offerings of which Malachi wrote in chapter 1, verse 10. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of hosts, nor will I accept an offering from you. This is something that we can rejoice in. This is a place where we can all say, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. Yet we still have the judgment of the wicked. 
In verse 5, then I will draw near to you for judgment, and I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against those who swear falsely and against those who oppress the wage earner in his wages, the widow and the orphan, and those who turn aside the alien. And do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. Here is your answer to where is the God of justice. And notice that God says, I will draw near to you, not the nations around Israel, but to the wicked in Israel. Those who do not fear God, who do not see him as he is, and they cannot worship him. The message of redemption and judgment of God's people is replete throughout the prophets. Redemption and, and judgment. Take Daniel for, exen- uh, for exa- example. In the end days, Daniel says in Daniel 2, verse 12, or chapter 12, verse 10, Many will be uh, purged, many will be purged, purified, and refined. But the wicked will act wickedly. And so God's justice will be meted out against the wicked. We see that same remedy here. Many will be purified and, and offer pleasing offerings. What is the chief end of man, right? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. But God will be both judge and a swift witness against the wicked. Remember, in the Old Testament, it took two witnesses for death sentence. But only one witness is needed when it's God. Redemption. Justice. There are two groups in this section. Those that God will refine and those that God will judge. Here's my concern today. There are thousands upon thousands of souls who have a low view of God and like Israel, mistakenly are quite confident that God will save them. Their worship is of a God that serves them because they have no interest in being purified and being conformed to the image of Christ. They want to continue living the life of the world, not in offering up worship that will be pleasing to God. And they will see the God of justice. Which group are you in? Which group do you want to be in? And if you are purified, it should make you weep for the lost because God is robbed of glory and they are judged by a swift witness. Live missionally. Multiply locally. Reach globally. Ken said that some of us need to go across the globe and some of us need to go across the street. Malachi 3, verse 6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. This is about God's immutability, his unchanging, but it's in light of his covenantal love. The fire is not a consuming fire. It's a refining fire. Where is the God of justice? Right here. And he is also the God of faithfulness and love and compassion. Only God. Only God can be both just and merciful. God says that my covenantal love saves you, O sons of Jacob. Their hope lies in God's love. And I pray for everyone that you see that the love of God is your only hope. Because apart from him, the justice of God is your biggest threat. All right, the next dispute arguably arguably starts here in verse 7, but undeniably goes down to verse 12. We now move from the topic of eschatology to tithing. Talk about baptism by fire, right? Seriously, though, if you think that this message is about tithing, I think you're missing the point, which I hope you'll see. Again, look for this accusation, objection, proof, 
remedy, and result outline. It starts by a statement in God, Malachi 3, verse 7. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. You have disobeyed. He calls them to repent. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me. That word means to turn around, about face, repent. And their objection. Their objection takes a new tact in their objection this time, or they take a new tact in their objection this time. With no shame, Israel denies God's accusations by playing dumb. But you say, how shall we return? Although the Mosaic law of blessing and obedience, of cursing with disobedience, have been given to them, they claim ignorance. This proof has nested in it another accusation, which they object to, so God proves the nested, ac- uh, nested accusation, and I know that's tough, but stick with me, even though I'm, I'm the third runner, okay? Okay. God's proof of rebellion is an accusation of their disobedience. His proof of rebellion is an accusation of their disobedience. Read this in verse 8. Will, you, will a man rob God, yet you are robbing me? Again, they are struck with a bout of ignorance in their next objection. But you say, how have we robbed you? God's second proof starts here in his answer, in tithes and offerings. As a result of your disobedience, God says in verse 9, you are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. You don't obey, and it's reflected in your worship and your tithes and your offerings. Your worship is broken because you don't have reverence for me or trust in me. That's why you turn away from me, so you are cursed. On our website, it lists seven things that are South Side distinctives. The very first one is a high view of God. Having a high view of God is seeing him as majestic, as supreme, like no one is above him, as sovereign, like like he rules over all. Holy. He is transcendent. He is above his creation. He's not beholden to it. Just to name a few. If you've been following along in Malachi the last few weeks, you can see that the exact opposite was going on in Israel at this time. They not only didn't have a high view of God, but they display disdain. They deny what he says about them. And they question his righteousness, his faithfulness, his very godship. This is confirmed in their worship, in their tithes and their offerings. They reject God, and they do it over and over and over. Malachi is not the first prophet to call Israel to repentance. Yet they continually reject the call because they are big and God is small. Has the Christian message today changed as well? Have we taken God's transcendence, his altogether holiness, and made Jesus our boyfriend and God our sky daddy? God is familiar to be sure. We call him Abba, Father. But we also worship a terrifying awesome God, God of power, a God of glory, whereby he told Moses that no man can see me and live. We need to have both views of God because God is both to us. He is our Father and he is our awesome God. And that view of God will reflect in our worship. It will be reflected in how we present our offerings. Fix your eyes on God, and your offerings will, be, will reflect your worship, your worship of Him. May this be a stark reminder 
to hold God in holiness. The seraphim and Isaiah call out to one another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is filled with his glory. What does that mean to you? What does that mean to us? That means that wherever we look on the earth, we see his glory. We would have to have blinders on to not see the glory of God. A high view of God demands worship. And worship drives obedience. The problem here is none of this is happening. There is no reference, reverence. There is no obedience. There is no worship. Again, in the last three disputes, we see with, with the remedy comes a promise of hope. The remedy, which actually starts in verse 7 with the return to me, has two imperatives here. Obey me, trust me. In verse 10, we see he charges them to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. Return to me, obey me, bring in the whole tithe. That is an indication of your worship, of your view of me. And in verse 10, it is the only place in the Bible where God says, put me to the test. This isn't in violation of Deuteronomy 6, verse 16, which says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That's a different word in the Hebrew. Here the word is one of encouraging to have faith in God. Trust in me. I am faithful Do we believe him? Do we take God at his word? So God is using tithing to show that their worship showed a lack of faith in him. Disobedience is primarily based on a lack of faith. Let me say that again. Disobedience is based primarily on a lack of faith. In Hebrews 3, verse 12, it says, Take care, brethren, that there be not that there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. And by contrast, a believing heart returns to God. It's a heart issue. We know that tithing was a part of the law, and Christ fulfilled the law, right? Turn to uh, 2 Corinthians 8. 2 Corinthians 8, if you wouldn't mind. Offerings now, are, are, uh, uh, offerings now are a worship based on how we see God in our heart. Let's look at the churches uh, in Macedonia as an example. 2 Corinthians 8, we're going to start in verse 1. Now, brethren, we wish to make known to you the grace of God which has been given in the churches of Macedonia, that in a great ordeal of affliction, their abundance of joy and their deep poverty overflowed in the wealth of their liberality. For I testify that according to their ability and beyond their ability, they gave of their own accord, begging us with much urging for the favor of participation in the support of the saints. And this, not as we had expected, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. Notice what happened first. They gave themselves to the Lord. They, in essence, returned to God. They had a heart for God. They had faith in Him. That giving of themselves was the catalyst for everything else they did. Their obedience was a manifestation of their faith. Their obedience was a manifestation of of their faith, and resulted in giving out of their poverty, out of their need, with much joy. This is not giving God our leftovers. This is presenting ourselves as a living sacrifice. May this set the course for how we obey and trust May we have a heart of worship that makes obedience a simple thing. 
that makes putting our trust in God an easy, easy thing to do because he is Yahweh, creator of all, giver of every good gift. Back to Malachi. Flip back to Malachi, chapter 3, verse 10. And test me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you a blessing until it overflows. Blessing. Did you hear that word? Blessed. And it means so much more than happiness. The etymology of it means that it is favored by God. I want blessed on my tombstone. (laughs) Take note of that. Back to our text. What is the result of the two imperatives of obedience and trust? What is the result? God puts himself on display to them. They long for the presence of God, and here is the promise of God revealing himself as sovereign over his creation. In verse 11, we see God do what only God can do. Then... I will rebuke the devourer for you so that it will not destroy the fruits of the ground, nor will your vine in the field cast its grapes, says the Lord of hosts. How sovereign is God that he can forbid pestilence? He can forbid blight. Mankind tries to mimic God, to mitigate or somehow limit pestilence and blight, but we can't rebuke it. Just ask any wheat farmer on the eastern plains about the sawfly. A supreme, all-powerful God can rebuke the devourer. And I hope that you are starting to see God being exalted above all else in these scriptures. This is a behold our God moment. This should again leave us praising him as we see that he is sovereign over all. Malachi is written for our example, for our edification, for our instruction, as it says in Romans 15, 4, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Only God can do this. Does this drive your worship? Does this demand your obedience? And the result. Finally, we see in verse 12 the result and the promise of hope in this dispute. Verse 12 says, All the nations will call you blessed, for you shall be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. There's that word again, blessed. All the nations will call you blessed. Blessed because God loves you. And notice, you will be called blessed, not your land. Again, a promise of God's covenantal love towards his people. God is faithful. God is trustworthy. God is unchanging. Therefore, you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed but blessed. Also notice, you shall be a delightful land. Not your land shall be a delightful, a delightful, but you shall be a delightful land. And this is in stark contrast to the land of Edom in Malachi chapter 1, verse 4, which reads, Thus says the Lord of hosts, they, Edom, may build, but I will tear down. And men will call them the wicked territory, and the people toward whom the Lord is indignant forever. Men will call them the wicked land, but you shall be a delightful land. Nations will call you blessed for the supreme, sovereign, covenant-keeping, loving, merciful God is your God. This should just continue to elevate our worship of him, yes? Yes? The formula laid out in this dispute is the same for us. Return. Obey. Trust. Blessed. 
Finally, notice that the remedy was given at the start of this dispute. Return to me is the call, but also the promise. And I will return to you. Hear the call. Receive the promise. If you truly don't know how to turn to God, it's simple. It's the same for all of us. It's something that we need to hear every day. Repent and believe. Recognize that you need Christ to do what only he can do. Refine you. Remove the wicked works from your life and work you into his image to change you from dirt and ore into something that reflects the glory of God. Then you will have a high view of God. Return to him. Obey him. Trust in him. Then, and only then, will you be blessed. Let's pray. Father, we are so humbled and thank, thankful for the great truths that you reveal in your word. We're, we're just uh, full of joy knowing that in your word, you preach to us. And our prayer is that our hearts would be full with the desire to see you lifted high in our lives, that we may proclaim your name by the love that we have for one another, that we would be about your business. We know that you are all-powerful, that you are sovereign, that you reign supreme. And so we ask, dear God, that you would continue to be before us and that you would continue to give us your spirit that we might be about your, your good business of proclaiming the good news of Christ, Christ coming as a refiner and as a judge and for the people that repent, that see him, that know who he is for blessing. We look forward to the day of Christ's return. We pray every day, dear God, that this would be the day of his return. But if he tarries, may we be about proclaiming who you are to those that need to see you, to know you, to trust you, obey you, and be blessed by you. We rejoice in all this, and we thank you, and we come before you because of the mediation and the sacrifice of our high priest, because of our Lord of Lords, because of our King of Kings. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen.